Blessings of Jesus, dear friends. This is Jacob Prash from Morial Ministries in partnership with Genesis Christian Radio and TV. We're looking today, please, at demonic symbolism and anti-Semitism, something that keeps recurring. We've addressed it more than once, but it seems to be showing its rather hideous head once again. Turn with me, please, to the Nehushtan, the Nehushtan, which in Hebrew means the bronze thing, literally, and that's found, of course, in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. Then they set out from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the journey. And the people spoke against God and Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we loathe this miserable food. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who was bitten when he looks at it, shall live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. This is the famous story of the Nechushtan, the bronze thing, and it's the basis of the most popular verse in the New Testament, John 3.16. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, Chapter 3. In verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Speaking, of course, of the crucifixion of Jesus. That whoever believes in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Notice the Nahushtan, the bronze thing is a picture of Jesus being crucified. He who knew no sin became sin. Now we know going all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 3, that serpents are figures of demons or devils. They were also represented as the Sheketzim, usually translated as detestable things. But the meaning of Sheketzim is a slimy reptile. The abomination of desolation in Aramaic from the book of Daniel, is called Hashikutz HaMeshomem, from Shekets, Shikutz. These were from the snake cults of the ancient Canaanites. For instance, the medical symbol, the, the caduceus, the caduceus, was from the snake-worshipping cult originating in Samaria and being adopted by the Greeks, and then by the Romans, and then it was adopted by the West as a medical symbol. Now, who would say this caduceus that the medical profession uses as a symbol is about demon worship? It doesn't mean that in the cultural context of which this caduceus is used. Who would say that Jesus is evil because he's represented by a bronze serpent? Well, quite a thing. In both cases, it is the context that determines if or not the thing is evil. The serpents were biting the people, but he who knew no sin became sin and was lifted up that Satan would no longer have power over us. This is the Nehushtan. And so you have the Nehushtan, a bronze serpent, and you have archaeological finds of the, of the Caduceus in Rome, Greece, ancient Near East, all the way back to the, to the Sumerians who invented the wheel, a symbol of the medical profession and of the healing arts in the ancient world. Is it evil in and of itself? No, it depends on the context. When the Shekhet Sim were placed in the temple in the days of Ezekiel, chapter 8, it was evil. It was an abomination. The abomination of desolation is the shekets, the shikuts of Meshomem. At the same time, Jesus is a bronze serpent. The context determines 
if or not something is evil. Let's understand the early church. We know very well that the symbols of the early church, the earliest church, was not the cross. It was the fish from Ichthus, which became an acronym in Greek for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. However, before Christianity existed, the fish was a symbol of the pagan fish god Dagon, the god of the Philistines. The mitre was a religious garb in the shape of a fish's head worn by the priests of Dagon. We see the Dagons fell down before the Ark of the Lord in the days of King David. Is a fish a symbol of Dagon worship, or is it a symbol of Jesus? Well, it depends on the context. In one place, it's evil. Another place, it isn't. So, too, the cross. If anyone has been to Scotland or Wales or Ireland, you will see graveyards and churches with the Celtic cross, a cross with a circle around it. That was a pre-Christian pagan symbol associated with sun worship by the Druids. It had existed as a pagan symbol of sun worship in the ancient Celtic superstition of the Druids, which had a demonic religion. We're talking here the people of Stonehenge and so forth. But it's in churchyards. It's in Christian graveyards, cemeteries. It's in public monuments in front of churches and cathedrals in Celtic countries. It means one thing in one culture, another thing in another culture. That's true of the ichthus, the fish. It's true of the cross. Who is going to say the cross is evil because before Christianity, the cross was used in sun worship? Who's going to say that the fish is evil as a symbol of Jesus, Ichthus, when the, because the fish before Christianity was used in the worship of Dagon? Who's going to say that the Nehushtan, a symbol of Jesus, is evil because it was used in the Canaanite snake cults? Well, let's go further with this. Israel has two symbols. Judaism has two symbols. If you can see this. One is the Magen David, the Star of David. But the other ins inscribed inside it is the Menorah, the Menorah. Jesus appeared next to the Menorah in Revelation chapter 1. It is not only a Jewish symbol, it is a Christian one. But the Magen David, the Magen David. Magen David in Hebrew does not mean Star of David. It means shield of David. In Judaism, it is God's shield, God's protection around Israel and his people. They actually place the names of the tribes in the spaces around the external, external parameters of the star, one for each tribe. That's what it means. In Judaism, it's not even seen as a star. It's not called a star. It's called a shield representing divine protection. Because in certain pagan cultures, it's a hexagram used in demonic superstition. Or like the pentagram, which is used in Satan worship. How can we necessarily say that the stars on Hollywood Boulevard are... are they're just a tourist attraction. They're not about Satan worship. They're memorials to movie stars who died or who, are, who became famous or something like this. They're just stars on the pavement on Hollywood Boulevard. They're not pentagrams there to worship Satan. They have a different meaning in one context. So, too, the six-pointed star has a different meaning in a different context. In Judaism and among the Jews, it is not a star at all. It's a shield. But I cannot tell you the number of ignorant Christians who say, this is a demonic symbol. It's a demonic symbol. 
So is the Nehushtan in John chapter 3. So is anything. So is the fish. Let's go further with this. In Revelation chapter 6, the Antichrist comes on a white horse. Counterfeiting Christ. In Revelation 19, Christ comes on a white horse. How dare Christ come on a white horse? Is he satanic? That's Antichrist. Why is Christ looking like the Antichrist? (laughs) This is absurd. The white horse means one thing in one context and another thing in another context. In one place, it's Christ. Another place, it's Antichrist. Let's go even further with this. In my youth, It was the early days of the space program. The project names of the space program took the names of constellations from the Zodiac. The first was Mercury. That was the first space program of NASA in the space race to the moon against the Soviets. The first was Mercury. Greek god, a messenger of the gods. The second, when they began putting two astronauts in the same capsule was called Gemini, GT1, Gemini Titan 1, Gemini Titan 2. The third, going to the moon, the third space program, the third was Apollo. Apollo was the Greek moon god. Apollo 11, Apollo 12, Apollo 13. NASA didn't mean the worship of stars or Greek gods. It was simply project names based on constellations. In one context, things like Gemini and Apollo meant one thing. In another context, they meant something completely different. But let's bring this back to the scripture. Jesus is plainly called the Lion of Judah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which we first see in Genesis 49, but quoted throughout scripture, he is the Lion of Judah. In both testaments. Satan goes around like a roaring lion looking for whom he can devour, Peter says. In one place, the lion's a picture of the devil. In another place, it's a picture of the Lord Jesus. It is the context that defines whether or not something is demonic. That is true in space programs. That is true in medical science with the caduceus. That is true in scripture. But you've got these ignorant people. You have demonic symbols. These people generally come in two forms. Some are honestly ignorant. They've been taught that, they've been told that, and that's all they think, that's all they know, because they don't know any better. They're just ignorant. There are others, however, that have a different agenda. They're anti-Semitic. They dislike Israel and the Jews. They point to the Israeli flag, they point to the Magen David, the shield of David, As the Star of David, it's a demonic hexagram. Well, why aren't you saying that about the fish or the cross? You can make the same argument. In other cultures, they represented things demonic. You see, it's not just ignorance. It's something else. Let's look at Zechariah, chapter 2, verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts of the knights of Aot, after glory he has sent me against the nations, against the Goyim, the ethnic nations, which plunder you, which plunder Israel, for he who touches you touches the apple of God's eye. Israel is the apple of God's eye. Like it or not, believe it or not, Romans 9, 10, and 11 tell us that the Jews remain the people of God 
and beloved of God because of God's promise to their fathers, the Avot, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's Romans 9 to 11. That's the teaching. Salvation comes from the Jews. If you hate the root of a tree, you must hate the tree. Anybody who hates Israel hates the church because Israel's covenants with God are the root of the church, according to Romans chapter 11. Anti-Semitism and Christianity are theologically and logically incompatible. But you have so-called Christians who are essentially anti-Semitic and who are saying this nonsense and telling other people this nonsense. We had one recently going on about my comments about the banksters of Wall Street in regard to certain current economic trends and the tide towards a one-world currency, screaming that, no wonder you have a hexagram. These bankers on Wall Street are Jews. The Jews control Hollywood. <laughs> What's going on in the, in the media? Well, let's look at this. Let's look at these claims. I used to work on Wall Street at one time. Let's look at the major banking families and institutions of Wall Street. America's first mega banker, J.P. Morgan, was not a Jew. He's the founder of what is today called Morgan Stanley. Chase was an American banker and secretary of the Treasury. He was the founder of Chase Manhattan, which today exists as Chase Bank. Main American banks. Investment banks like Brown Brothers Harriman. Neither Averill Harriman, his father, or the Brown Brothers are Jewish. The biggest American banking dynasty, undoubtedly the Mellon family. Not Jewish. Never were. Going back to the 19th century, Jay Gould, mega banker, used banking to get control of railroads and things, was not, was not a Jew. The chairman of Chase Manhattan became David Rockefeller from the oil family. Again, David Rockefeller, the Rockefellers were not Jewish. Brown Brothers, Harriman, Morgans, Mellons, none of them Jewish. Now you can say there are Jewish banking families, particularly in Europe, the Rothschilds. It's true. And you can say there are Jewish banking families on Wall Street or banking institutions founded by Jews on Wall Street. Well, well, that is absolutely true. Goldman Sachs. But to say it's dominated or controlled by Jews, that's ridiculous. In Britain, the biggest banking family that are indigenously British are the Barclays brothers. Barclays, the English Roman Catholics. Private investment banking, Close Brothers, not Jewish. Yes, there are Jews in the banking establishment, but to say it's a Jewish enterprise is absurd. They go on and on like this. Jews control Hollywood. There is and always has been a disproportionate amount of Jewish talent in Hollywood. If you don't like Steven Spielberg's movies, don't like his movies. But don't hate him for being a Jew. A lot of people like his movies, like Schindler's List and so forth. Well, let's understand this. The founder of Hollywood was Cecil B. DeMille. He was not a Jew. Hollywood's biggest producer, the biggest producer in Hollywood, the biggest financially, George Lucas, is not a Jew. You've got Putnam, you've got Japanese interest in Hollywood, Sony pictures and things like this. To call it a Jewish enterprise is absurd. Oh, there's a lot of Jews in it. But it's not controlled by any Jewish cabal. Never has been. Never. Las Vegas the same. Howard Hughes was not a Jew. Uh... <laughs> Never has been what they say. When the corporations took Las Vegas away from the mafia, 
It was like MGM and companies like that. It was not Jewish interests. But let's look further. Oh, the Jews control the media. If the Jews control the media, I would like to know why there is so much anti-Israel bias in the mainstream media. Let's look at the United States. They're not anti-Israel, but they are the biggest news network in the United States is Fox. Rupert Murdoch also controls Sky in the UK. He's a Presbyterian born in Australia of Scottish ancestry. He's not Jewish. Ted Turner, founder of CNN, he's not Jewish. The biggest American newspaper chain, Gannett's, not Jewish. Go to Britain, the Times, the Telegraph, the Guardian, not Jewish. This is just bias. Oh, there are Jews in the media. There are Jews in banking. There are Jews in Hollywood. But to say it's controlled, or the music industry is controlled? Let's go further with this. Much of the music industry today is based in Nashville, Tennessee. There are hardly any Jews in it. In, in, in the country and Western music, hardly any Jews. But moving forward, let's look at high tech, the new economy, the real economy for the time in which we live. Is Bill Gates Jewish? No. Is Mr. Ellis, the founder of Oracle, Jewish? Yes. Is Jeff Bezos, the wealthiest man in the world who runs Amazon, Jewish? No. Is the founder of Apple, the biggest corporation, the biggest high-tech manufacturer of hardware in the world, Jewish? Was Steve Jobs Jewish? No. Jeff Bezos? No. Bill Gates? No. Sure you've got Mr. Ellis and Mr. Zuckerberg. Sure there are Jews in it. Same as Hollywood. Same as the media. Same as banking. But to say they control it? Wall Street? The biggest fund manager, by far the biggest fund manager in the United States, is Warren Buffett. Nobody comes near him in the total size of the portfolio he manages on behalf of his clients and members. He's not Jewish. It gets more and more absurd. A warning to those who say such stupid, irresponsible, baseless things devoid of any realistic foundation. He who touches you touches the apple of God's eye. No nation, no empire who has ever persecuted the Jews or the true church has not come under the judgment of God. None. Germans built the wall around the Jewish ghettos. During the Holocaust, any Jew climbing over the wall was machine gunned. So there was a wall built around the capital of the Reich, Berlin, Any German climbing over that wall was machine gunned. Not until Rudolf Hess died, not until the last Nazi responsible for the Holocaust and the Blitz was dead, did one brick of that wall come down, about two weeks later. Spain was the world power until the Inquisition. Then came Francis Drake and Britannia ruled the waves. Spain lost it. Soviet Union, let my people go, persecuted the Jews, begins with Stalin, murdered the Jewish intellectuals and party members. He had Trotsky assassinated, he had Zinoviev murdered, not that I was any fan of any communist, but he wouldn't let ordinary Jews immigrate to Israel. This continued 
all the way until the 1980s. Then God raised his hand against the Soviet Union, as happened to Spain, as happened to Germany, as happened to any nation going back to the ancient world who persecuted them. You stick your finger in the apple of God's eye. If you persecute the true church, you will come under the judgment of God. And if you touch his people, Israel, you will keep his promise to Abraham. I will curse them that curse thee. Now, when anti-Semites who are not believers say these things and do these things, that kind of anti-Semitism has always been around. Always. But when it's people claiming to be Christian, now we have a problem. As we say all the time, heads and tails. We can distinguish between heads and tails, but we cannot separate them. The true church and the Jewish nation. Put enmity between you and the woman, your seed and her seed. Begins in Revelation, I'm sorry, begins in Genesis chapter 3, ends in Revelation chapter 12. Who did the Roman Empire turn against? Persecuted the Christians, 70 AD, 120 AD, also the Jews. Who did the Soviet Union persecute the most? Born again Christians and Jews. Who did the Roman Catholic persecute the most with their inquisitions? Saved Christians, like the followers of John Huss and the Waldensians, and then the Lollards in England, and the Jews. Hatred of the Jews and of the true church are simply two sides of the same coin. (laughs) Abraham's the father of all who believed. If any entity goes against Israel today, they'll go against the true church tomorrow and vice versa. If they hate the Jews, they're going to hate the church. Give them enough time. And if they hate the church, they're going to turn on the Jews. Give them enough time, and it won't take much time. All history has been like that. In Revelation 12, after the man-child is rescued, what does the dragon do? Goes after the woman, way back to Genesis chapter 3. Now again, that's the world. That's the Muslim world. That's the Roman Catholic world. That's the secular world. It's the world! What do we expect from the world? Not much. But what does God expect from Christians? He expects them to believe what's in his word. The people who are caught up in this thinking are at best ignorant. At best ignorant. But very commonly, they are not only ignorant but bigoted. I would say to them to look at what the Holy Spirit said to them through Paul the Apostle. What I say doesn't matter. What has God said? Romans 11. I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles inasmuch that I am an apostle of the Gentiles, that is non-Jews, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them, for if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? He goes on, do not be arrogant towards the branches, that is the natural branches, the Jews. But if you are arrogant, remember that it's not you who supports the root, the reza, but the reza, the root, supports you. You will say branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. God cut away Jews to make way for Englishmen or Norwegians or Asians. That is true. Quite right, Paul says in verse 20. They were broken off for their unbelief. 
But you, stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. If God not, did not spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. And he goes on to say, if they do not continue in unbelief, they'll be grafted in again. And he says it's a mystery, but they will be grafted in again. We've often said there have been many times in history when saved Christians thought it was the end of the age, the last days the Lord was coming. Many times in history. Many times. What makes this time in history different from the other times? What was missing in the other times in history when saved Christians thought it was the end of the age? That's not missing now. Don't forget, in the aftermath of the Reformation, many of the Anabaptists thought that the papacy was falling and the gospel was being preached and Jesus was going to come. In the year Y1K, 1000, Pope Sylvester said the Lord will be back next year. (laughs) There were believers in England who believed Napoleon was the Antichrist in the Napoleonic Wars. There have been many times these things have happened going back to the early church. What makes this time different? Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until, Petheron, the time of the ethnon, Gentiles, are fulfilled. Jerusalem is no longer a Gentile city. It's a Jewish city, predominantly. Now, it's still under the feet of the Gentiles because the Temple Mount is defiled by Islam. But Daniel says this will end. The Jews are back in that land and in that city. Jesus made it clear in Matthew 23, 39, the Jews would have to be back in Jerusalem to proclaim him as Messiah when he returns, saying, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Zechariah 12, 1 to 10, Jesus in the Old Testament, speaking by the Holy Spirit in the first person, the burden of the Lord concerning Jerusalem. They, the Jews of Jerusalem, will look upon me who they have pierced and mourn as one mourns for an only son, and it will not only be the Jews. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 tells us it will be all the tribes of the earth. Additionally, Jews are coming to faith again in significant numbers. There's a lot of problems in the Messianic movement, theologically and otherwise. This is for sure, as there is in the church. But what is without doubt is that more Jews are coming to Christ now as the Messiah than any time in history since the second century. It's happening in America, it's happening in Europe, it's happening in Russia, happening in Israel. It's happening. It's no longer missing. This is why we use the symbol. The prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews will take place. Now understand something. By recognition of the prophetic significance of Zionism and the rebirth of Israel does not mean I endorse everything the Israeli government does. Any more than a Union Jack or an American flag means I necessarily agree with everything Her Majesty's government or the U.S. government does. It's a symbol of the country, not of the government. My support of the Jews and of their right to their land as the indigenous people of that land does not mean I always agree with everything done by the Israeli government by any means. Many Israelis disagree with their government on many issues. It's a democracy, the only democracy, real democracy in the Middle East, anything close to it. It does not mean I always agree with the Israeli government, I do not. And it certainly does not mean I endorse Talmudic Judaism. What is called Judaism today, as I've said many times, is not real Judaism. 
It is rabbinism. It is Talmudic, not Levitical. It is rabbinic, not mosaic. It was invented by people. It was not given by God. In fulfillment of the prophecies of Jeremiah chapter 2, once the Messiah was rejected, they would invent another Judaism. It is a false Judaism based on the rabbis instead of the Levitical priesthood, based on the synagogue instead of the temple worship and so forth. It's a false Judaism. But Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and mainstream Protestantism, Christendom is not Christianity. It is a false Christianity. Just as Judaism, as it exists today, better called rabbinism, is not Levitical, but Talmudic. So mainstream Christendom is patristic, not apostolic. In other words, it was invented by the post-Nicene church fathers. It didn't come directly from the New Testament. Judaism should be called rabbinism. Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, the World Council of Churches should be called Christendom. It's not true Christianity. And it's not true Judaism. But there is a true Judaism. The law points to the Messiahship of Yeshua who fulfills it. And there is a true Christianity, the original faith of the New Testament. They have their symbols. They have their symbols. The early Christians had an Alpha and Omega, like the one on back of me. Or the early Christians had an ichthos, a fish. Then it became a cross. Jews had a menorah. Then it became a shield of David. It is the cultural context that defines what a symbol means, not the symbol itself. The lion. The lion is neutral. In one context, it's the lion of Judah, the Lord Jesus. It's another, Satan, seeing whom he can devour. The brazen serpent. In one context, it is the snake cults of the Canaanites. In another context, it's a picture of the Lord Jesus being lifted up on the cross. This is what the scripture teaches. These are the theological and doctrinal realities. These are the scriptural realities. And these are the historical realities. Don't believe these silly, ignorant people. Believe the word of God. My name is James Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for listening.